In our last video, we talked about how glycolysis can split a 6-carbon glucose into two 3-carbon pyruvates, providing us with ATP, ready to be used energy, as well as NADH, a high energy electron carrier molecule that will donate its electrons to the electron transport chain. What we want to look at now is what happens to this pyruvate, this pyruvic acid, as it moves through and continues down the process. Now, our next major step is the Krebs cycle. However, pyruvic acid is not the substrate for the Krebs cycle. Acetyl-CoA is. So we've got a reaction that links the two, glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, that we're going to have to look at. And then we're going to take, and that'll produce ATP for us, then we're going to take all our NADHs and our FADH2s, and we're going to look at what happens at the electron transport chain. <coughs> So remember, pyruvate is produced from glycolysis, but acetyl-CoA is what we need. And so pyruvate is going to next be processed by a multi-enzyme complex. This is a common theme in biochemistry where uh, multiple enzymes that catalyze sequential steps in some kind of a reaction are actually aggregated together for efficiency. One of the three enzymes in this complex is called pyruvate dehydrogenase. And so it's the whole complex is named after that one, pruvate dehydrogenase multi-enzyme complex. Three things happen in this whole process. One of the three carbons of pruvate gets broken off and released as a CO2 molecule. This enzyme here is called a decarboxylase. Now we've got two carbons left. Our remaining two carbons are called acetate or acetyl when they're attached to something else. So the next enzyme takes our remaining acetate and covalently but temporarily binds it to a molecule called coenzyme A that produces acetyl coenzyme A. We'll refer to this as acetyl CoA. These two carbons here are what remain of our original glucose. In the midst of all this, there are some high energy electrons to be gained, and so there is a dehydrogenase, the pyruvate dehydrogenase, that is going to uh, strip electrons off the pyruvate and hand them off to NAD+, converting it to NADH, and we know that those are going to go to the electron transport chain. So we have a dehydrogenase. We have this middle one called an acetylase because it's adding an acetyl group to something, and we have our bottom one uh, that is a decarboxylase. Now think for a minute, how many times is this going to happen for each glucose? Each glucose, which is 6 carbon, produces 2 pyruvates, so we're going to have to go through this twice. So on a per-glucose basis, this pyruvate dehydrogenase multi-enzyme complex will produce two NADHs, two acetyl-CoAs, and two carbon dioxides. If you take a deep breath and exhale, a third of the CO2 that you're exhaling comes from your pyruvate dehydrogenase complex associated with your mitochondria. A third of of a bacterium's CO2 that it releases is also coming from its pruvate dehydrogenase multi-enzyme complex. Of course, assuming that it's using glucose as its primary carbon uh, and electron source. So now we have our acetyl-CoAs and we can push them into the Krebs cycle. Now, like with glycolysis, uh, I didn't want you to memorize all the enzymes and all the intermediates. Same thing here. I'll highlight a few that you should know. Krebs cycle, as you notice, is not a linear pathway. It's cyclic, and we'll see how that happens in a minute. There are eight enzymes involved. We're just going to call them enzymes one through eight, and don't memorize even that. Just memorize that there are eight of them, so you're familiar with that. At the top, you see our acetyl-CoA coming in, and the first enzyme in the process is going to take those two carbons, and it's going to covalently attach them to a four-carbon molecule called oxaloacetate and we're going to form a 6-carbon citrate, or citric acid. That's where it gets its alternative name, the citric acid cycle, or the tricarboxylic acid cycle, because we have acetate, oxaloacetate, and citrate all coming together in that first, uh, that first step. Now, you might be thinking, this is kind of crazy. We just spent all this work to break down our glucose from 6 carbons into this little 2-carbon guy, and now we're reattaching it to a 4-carbon molecule and making another 6-carbon molecule, citrate. Think of that oxaloacetate as a carrier. It's, it's, yeah, it's bound to those two carbons of acetyl uh, from the acetyl-CoA. The CoA, by the way, gets released during that binding and can be used again in the next round of pruvate dehydrogenase step. The oxaloacetate is going to hand off those two carbons. They're going to get 
oxidized all the way to CO2. Guess what? That's the end of our carbon that originated in our glucose. And then the remaining steps, we're just going to rearrange what's left back into our four carbon oxaloacetate so it can take on another two carbon acetyl group. So think of the oxaloacetate just as a carrier molecule for those two carbons from the acetyl group above. All right. In eight steps, we're going to attach the acetyl group to oxaloacetate, make it citrate, and then we're going to turn around and oxidize those carbons into CO2. We're going to have to do this twice per glucose, aren't we? Because per glucose, we got two pyruvates, which went through the pyruvate dehydrogenase step twice and gave us two acetyl-CoA's. So we're going to, per gl uh, glucose molecule, we're going to blow off four carbon dioxides. We already lost two of them at our last step, so there goes all six of our carbons. We are going to gain uh, one ATP per acetyl-CoA, or two per glucose, by substrate-level phosphorylation. Now, to be completely honest, it actually forms a GTP, a guanosine triphosphate, but they are essentially equivalent within the cell, and they can actually be interconverted. The cell can use GTP to drive certain reactions, but if it's ATP that it needs, it can convert the GTP over into an ATP. So we're going to get two more. And we're going to get three more NADHs per acetyl group, or six more per glucose. And you can see those at steps three, four, and eight. So more cat, uh, 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 checks that we can cache at the electron transport chain. And then we got a new electron carrier that we haven't seen yet, FADH2. Like NAD+, FAD is a high-energy electron carrier coenzyme for certain dehydrogenases. Some of them use that. Um, we're not going to get into any great detail about how they're different. They're slightly different. Basically the electrons in FADH2 are being held in a slightly lower energy state than those electrons being held in NADH, but for our purposes that's not going to affect things much. Um, we're going to move on and look at the electron transport chain, but I'd really recommend that you pause and you do some accounting. Okay, Starting with our glucose molecule, what's happened to all of our carbons and what's happened to all the electrons and when and where have ATPs been produced by substrate level phosphorylation? Definitely worth taking your time to work through those big picture questions to track everything up to this point. All right, let's look briefly. We're going to oversimplify the electron transport chain. <clears throat> We're going to look at uh, a gram negative. So you've got your outer membrane, your LPS layer, and your inner cytoplasmic membrane. You can see where the cytoplasm is. You can see where the exterior environment is. The space between the two is the periplasm. Uh, I, on this, this little diagram in PowerPoint, I haven't drawn a peptidoglycan cell wall, but there's a thin wall uh, in the midst, of that, um, the midst of that periplasm. The electron transport chain is a series of proteins and lipid carriers. There's only one lipid carrier. The rest are proteins that can shuttle electrons around. And with each step, as they pass off the electrons, these are all redox reactions, as they pass off electrons, a little bit of energy is released. The electrons drop in their energy state. You can picture it like a little kid sitting at the top of a slide. Right? They're sitting at the top of the slide, and as they move down the slide, they have less and less potential energy available until they get to the bottom and land on their butt. And now there's no energy left at all, right? because they're already they're as low as they're going to get. NADH and FADH2 donate their electrons to these carrier molecules, and they get transferred from one to the next to the next to the next. Ultimately, the very last one in the sequence will hand those electrons off to oxygen in the cytoplasm, reduce the oxygen to water, and somehow magically ATP is produced, right? Well, it's not magic. It's something we call chemiosmosis or chemiosmotic theory. At some of those electron carriers, as the electrons move through those carriers in the membrane, some of them can use the energy of the electrons moving through, almost like a current in a wire, to drive the movement, the translocation of a proton from the cytoplasm into the periplasm and accumulate them. So now we've got a hydrogen ion or proton gradient. This is valuable. This is an electrochemical gradient. Now those hydrogens that are in the periplasm are going to desperately want to get across the inner membrane back into the cytoplasm to equilibrium, but guess what? They can't because they're charged. No matter how small they are, they have a plus one charge. They can't wiggle across that membrane on their own unless there's something there to help 
the protons get across and take advantage of the energy that's released as the gradient is dissipated, as the gradient returns back to a state of equilibrium. It just so happens that there is something very handy that can be used. We call it the ATP synthase. And we call that pressure of hydrogen ions built up in the periplasm the proton motive force, the PMF. As those protons are allowed to come back into the cytoplasm through the ATP synthase, it drives it like a machine. So it grabs an ADP, grabs an inorganic phosphate, and covalently attaches them at the expense of the energy being released from this downhill flow of protons. Protons, if you remember, uh, we measure proton concentration as pH. The pH in the periplasm is very low. It's very acidic. The pH in the cytoplasm is neutral. It's a much higher pH. We have fewer protons there, and therefore it's less acidic. Therefore, the protons are going to move from the periplasm to the cytoplasm, and that'll drive our ATP synthase. This, folks, is what we call oxidative phosphorylation. You can see why oxidative phosphorylation requires an entire electron transport chain, all the proton pumps involved, and an ATP synthase. Take some time as you study to compare that to substrate level phosphorylation that takes place back in the Krebs cycle and in glycolysis. All right, I'm going to leave you with this slide here, uh, a review of aerobic cell respiration. Make sure you're comfortable with all this before you move on to the next video.